the one thing that we haven't talked about just yet is sleep and airway. <laughs> yeah, I know that was a hot, like a, yes. I'm going to push it a little bit. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about it. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Um, because in dental school, as you know, we were talking previously, mm-hmm. um, we learn about sleep, you know, OSA, mm-hmm. appliances, and things like that. It's actually good yeah. that you learn that. Yeah. Because a lot of dental schools don't even teach that. Yep. So it was great that Florida yep. provided you that information. Yep. So they created an awareness. Yep. All right. Um, the... The way, though, that we're taught in dentistry, and I did this for mm-hmm. years, so I'm speaking from um, I'm speaking from the point of view of someone that's gone through this. Yeah, past experience. I've made I made appliances for years, and my only focus was making mandibular advancement appliances for people that had apnea. Mm-hmm. At the beginning of the whole thing, you could just it was like the Wild Wild West. You can make whatever you want. You didn't need any guidance. It's like oh, you snore, let's go, mm-hmm. right? Then it became more uh, regulated where I had to have a sleep study from a physician and a letter of medical necessity in order to make it. Okay. And so I formed relationships with sleep physicians and started making a bunch of these. Okay. All right. So I was doing sleep dentistry. Okay. Okay. Problem. So there are three. First problem is that it was really just focused on the fat old man that had apnea. Mm-hmm. And I kept finding kids and TMD patients, young fit female kinds of patients that had airway problems. But they didn't fit. I mean, like, what am I going to do? Send them in, get a, a, they're not going to write me a letter of medical necessity on a four-year-old to make a mandibular advancement appliance, right? Right, right. right. And so it, my model didn't fit what the patients I was seeing. And so I started getting frustrated because I would send those patients in and the sleep studies weren't providing me any guidance mm-hmm. anymore, right? So that's the fir- one of the first problems is it really focuses on apnea. And I think a lot of the patients that you and I see in dentistry are the, we'll call them the pre-apnea patient. Mm-hmm. They are symptomatic from a malocclusion, bruxism, reflux type of standpoint. Right. But they haven't gotten sick enough to really catch the attention of medicine at this right. point in time. Is that right? where your interest in airway came? Yeah. yeah. Came from bruxism, nice. actually. So my interest was in bruxism. I wanted to figure out why people ground their teeth. Yep. And nice. so I started looking into that. Okay. And actually, it, that's part of the evolution because sleep talks about apnea. And I thought, because that's what I was doing, mm-hmm. I, that there was a relationship between apneic events and bruxism. And there's a very weak relationship between true big time apnea and bruxism. The relationship is on lower level events, inspiratory flow limited breathing. Mm -hmm. So the airway begins to shut down Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the body reacts to it. Mm -hmm. So people that grind are very reactive to things. So if I sent that patient in and got a sleep study done, they'd say, no, they don't really have apnea, but they ground a lot. Mm -hmm. I go, so there weren't any relationship. And it was disappointing until I finally realized they just weren't testing for what I really needed them to test for. Mm -hmm. They needed to be testing for these little events, and that's rarely done in sleep laboratories. Right. Okay. So we know there's a relationship between these airway types of events and bruxing. And so, yes, Mm -hmm. that fueled this idea that we're missing something by just focusing on sleep. Okay. The other, the second problem that I had was that if I got a patient that came into my practice that had the sleep study in the letter of medical necessity, mm-hmm. I always did the same thing. I made a mand- mandibular advancement appliance. Right. That was that was it. And I, you know, for years I didn't think about it. All I thought about is this sucks because <laughs> I changed their bite. A lot of people didn't like it. They wanted their money back or didn't work. Right. Mm-hmm. So I was frustrated by it. But I didn't think through the whole, the whole process. Right. And then it finally, when I was really more focused on airway, I realized, you know, there are a whole bunch of people that I've made night guards for mm-hmm. that said, I can't sleep without that thing. Mm-hmm. And I've had a whole bunch of people I've made night guards for that said, you know, my wife told me I stopped snoring when I started wearing this thing. Mm-hmm. And it 
all of a sudden I'm going, ah, it's not Mm -hmm. that I fixed the second molar interference and made the occlusion perfect. Mm -hmm. It was that that little bit of vertical dimension was Mm -hmm. enough to make them breathe better, sleep better. Yeah. And that led us on the trail of trying to find the appropriate appliance for the patient that Mm -hmm. we started today, the Seattle Protocol. And it's a provisional way to find the right appliance. So instead, in my practice, instead of always making mandibular advancement appliances, I make appliances, but I make the right appliance. Right. So it may be a night guard. It may be an anterior repositioning splint. It's the right appliance for that particular patient rather than always being that one particular device time and time again. Right? And the other flaw that I saw in sleep dentistry is, so they showed you to make make a mandibular advancement appliance, mm-hmm. right? What do you do after that? What's the next step? Well, they're in okay. one, right? The next step is you continue to manage them and eventually you have to replace it, yeah. right? How does that make sense? Why wouldn't I get them under control and then try to make them better somehow? Because mm-hmm. we know that almost every case you're gonna see began as an anatomic problem. Mm-hmm. So why not make the anatomy better? So I, I, mm-hmm. like CPAP and mandibular advancement appliances don't make sense because they just, it's like, okay, you've got a disease, here's a Band-Aid, right. you're done. And we never try to maybe clean out the wound mm-hmm. and get them healthier and let it heal. Right, it's back to health again. So that's what we wanna do. Yeah. So the difference between sleep and airway to me is, is a chasm, a huge chasm between mm-hmm. those two. And when people use the term, that's what we were joking about earlier. Yep. When they use those terms interchangeably, it bugs me. Yeah. Because they're not the same. Yeah. They're not even close to being the same.